effective missions of the UH-1 helicopter in combat is infiltration and exfiltration of friendly forces deep into enemy territory. Using firepower from helicopter gunships, the most economical method of neutralizing guerrilla forces is to hit them in their sanctuaries. The elements of surprise, firepower and mobility are all on the side of the attacker. For whether the insurgent force is large or small, the mere sight of an armed helicopter in his area causes great concern. Before attempting such missions in enemy territory, however, a number of planning factors must be considered. First, what is the capability of your helicopter? The UH-1F is the Air Force model of the UH-1 helicopter series known as the Huey. Two general configurations are used in the combat environment. A slick or unarmed helicopter is used primarily for carrying troops and cargo. When used in combat, the slick has two light machine guns for defense. A modular concept permits quick changeability from slick to gunship. Installation of a number of systems on the basic airframes is possible in a matter of minutes. This display shows the weapon system that can be installed on the aircraft in one hour by an expert crew. With these systems, the slick aircraft becomes a gunship. In the gunship configuration, the UH-1F is an armament platform carrying two LAU-59 rocket pods with a total of 14 rockets and two pintle-mounted 7.62 miniguns which can be fired at either 2,000 or 4,000 rounds per minute with a total of 12,000 rounds. An armament panel to fire the guns and rockets is located in the cockpit on the console between the pilot and co-pilot. The gunship also has armored seats and self-sealing fuel tanks. With guns and rocket systems installed, fully loaded and fueled with air crew, gunners and their equipment, the UH-1F weighs 9,000 pounds. With this load, you are operating at maximum gross weight. With a full fuel load of 245 gallons and one pilot, however, the weight is only 6,500 pounds. The armament system is simple but effective. The rocket gun sight folds down in front of the pilot as he prepares to fire. If a gunner gets hit, or if the pilot can more easily fire along a trail, or wants to estimate where the rockets will impact, he uses the forward fire position. In the forward fire position, parallel to the axis of the aircraft, the guns are locked in this position, bore sighted to the pilot's gun sight. The bore sighting is done after the equipment is installed. The change from side fire to forward fire position can be made anytime. The gunners can quickly accomplish in-flight maintenance of the gun. Storing weapons inside the aircraft with doors closed permits an increase of approximately seven knots in airspeed. Pilots who have flown the Huey in combat consider it a very effective and reliable weapon system. It is also used by the United States Air Force's Southern Command to train pilots and air crews of the Air Forces of the Americas. Courses are taught at Albrook Air Force Base in the Canal Zone and are also presented in the home countries by mobile training teams. Tactical missions are accomplished using armed and unarmed helicopters. Most missions require the use of both. Infiltration cannot be planned without thorough reconnaissance of the landing zone, surrounding terrain, location of friendly and unfriendly forces, and location of possible enemy ground fire. A landing zone for a covert infiltration mission should have these features. It should be a small clearing, not obviously usable by a helicopter. It should be several kilometers from population. It should offer immediately available cover for the infiltration team. It should not be close to well-used trails. Likewise, it should not be adjacent to a river. 
Very large clearings may be used only if terrain features offer appropriate cover for the aircraft and the team. Make every attempt to locate an ideal landing zone. Also select an alternate LZ at least two kilometers from the primary in case you are shot out of your first choice. Planning begins when the pilot and the patrol team leader discuss the area to be infiltrated and decide the best area in which to locate the landing zone. Aerial photos, maps, and even rough drawings may be used to plan the reconnaissance and minimize actual flights over the area. During your reconnaissance, it is best to fly once over the area at altitude and select your LZ. Lingering over the exact area may alert the enemy. Helicopters may be a rare sight in your reconnaissance area, so do not draw attention to any area less than seven to eight kilometers square. If possible, make your reconnaissance look like a routine cross-country flight. The enemy can easily deduce your intentions if you are careless in your approach to or reconnaissance of the landing zone. The enemy is more familiar with the terrain than you are. Don't underestimate his intelligence. It is often necessary to plan a flight path at treetop level to an intended landing zone. At this altitude, you are less vulnerable to ground fire and the enemy is less able to determine your intentions. It's hazardous to stay at tree top level any longer than necessary in the event of engine failure. With visibility limited, navigation is very difficult and possibly inaccurate. Always take advantage of terrain features. For example, fly just below ridge lines, crossing the ridge lines at 90 degree angles. To avoid enemy fire, keep away from traveled roads, valleys, rivers, and prominent hilltops. A variety of techniques may be used to infiltrate a team into enemy territory. Remember, the enemy may have landing zone watchers among the villagers or in the local militia. They can call for reinforcements and report your landing by radio, by gunshots, or by other means of signaling. Watchers may be stationed in trees. Confine radio transmissions to a minimum and encode them as much as possible. Whether you are making a high level or a low level insertion into a landing zone, the best gun coverage is with the gunships in trail position. High level deception can be accomplished by having a similar formation fake landings in other landing zones three to six kilometers distant, but in easy view of the actual landing area. The sight of helicopters will be considered normal by the local population if routine flights are made over the LZ area before the day of insertion. At a release point, the insert helicopter descends to low level, five to 10 kilometers from the landing zone. A command and control helicopter familiar with the primary and alternate landing zones directs the insert pilot. The insert helicopter can go unescorted or he may be accompanied by two gunships in trail, 500 meters spacing. The gunships pass just to one side of the landing zone. Their spacing allows the slick helicopter to exit the landing zone and fall in trail on the gunships, usually unnoticed by the casual observer on the ground. After exiting the landing zone, the helicopter should remain on the trees for about five kilometers. In easily navigated terrain, where command and control is not required, a single flight of three can proceed low level to make the insert, using any variety of flight paths desirable to obtain maximum deception. When using false insertion techniques, the element of risk should be kept in mind. 
It helps no one to fake an insert into an enemy gun position. In the area of the landing zone, known as the insert area, altitude should be 1,500 to 3,000 feet above terrain. This altitude provides the best combination of protection from enemy ground fire, enables the pilot to discern terrain features, and permits rapid descent into the landing zone. All descents should be made as rapidly as possible without going into full auto rotation. Terrain features should be used for concealment wherever possible. Maintain 80 to 100 knots airspeed, reducing it as the landing zone is approached. Final approaches should be short, fast, and on the treetops if possible. Vertical descent into the landing zone must be slow and cautious in order to avoid trees and stumps. Takeoff should be slow and vertical until the aircraft is clear of all obstacles. Leave the area at treetop level for at least two kilometers then a maximum performance climb to altitude. Use the same precautions as before. Cross ridges at a 90 degree angle. Vary heading to avoid flying down valleys and stream beds. Build airspeed to 80 or 100 knots as soon as possible. Exfiltration or recovery of friendly forces from enemy territory is often a life or death situation. Gunships should therefore be available at all times, less than 30 minutes notice if possible. The slicks should not be launched until it is known that there will be no delay in completing the extraction. Premature launch may cause a fuel problem and complicate the mission. Helicopter gunships must be able to provide enough firepower so that the ground team can break contact with the enemy and, if necessary, move to a landing zone suitable for pickup. Timing is the single most important factor during a hot extraction. In every case, there will be a time when enemy resistance is at its lowest point. The helicopter pickup must be made at this time. If a team is not in trouble, the gunships merely check the LZ and identify the team. Then the slick immediately picks them up. Using a sit-down landing zone if possible affords the maximum protection for air crew and passengers. If a sit-down LZ is not available, locate an area where rope ladders or the McGuire rigs can be used. Rope ladder extraction is used when the helicopter cannot get near enough to the ground for the team to jump on board, but can get to within about 20 feet. No more than one man should be on the ladder at a time. The air crew should try to pull in the ladders before takeoff, since they can easily become caught in the trees. If the aircraft cannot get close enough to use rope ladders, then the McGuire rig is used. This method of extraction should be used only as a last resort because it exposes the helicopter and the patrol team to ground fire. When making an approach for a McGuire rig pickup, locate the team area while still at altitude. This may require a smoke signal from the ground party. The gunships will assist in locating and talking to the team. Make a fast descent to the treetops, about 500 meters from the landing zone, and continue to the target.
landing zone, when you have located the team, lower the McGuire rakes. Use the treetops to conceal your aircraft while hovering. Three persons may be recovered at one time. A trapeze wrist lock is incorporated into the rake for security. team gives the all clear signal, the pilot begins a very slow vertical ascent. Care must be taken not to snag the rigs or entangle the people in trees. Coordination between the pilot and crew chief is critical at this point. When the rigs are clear of trees, Start building airspeed to a maximum 50 to 60 knots and continue climb to at least 2,000 feet above terrain. Do not exceed this airspeed or the extreme stress placed upon the McGuire rake passengers may cause them to become unconscious and possibly fall out of the slain. Fly the team to the nearest relatively secure point available for landing come to a hover while they are still about 100 feet off the ground. Descend vertically, settling the team members gently on the ground. Remember, the maximum time anyone can ride the McGuire rig before complete exhaustion is about 30 minutes. Needless to say, exfiltration is always hazardous. Its most dangerous hazard is ground fire. The most consistent hazard is confined area operations. Blades can strike trees and cause quick, disastrous damage. The necessity to operate the aircraft at the limit of its capability most of the time requires the most highly proficient crews. Night extractions are all but impossible. They have been accomplished with the use of flare lighting of the LZ, but the operation is always very hazardous. Helicopter units, operating for extended periods of time at forward locations away from their home stations, require continued logistic support. Resupply is usually accomplished with fixed wing transport aircraft. In locations without airstrips, however, such missions are performed by helicopters flying to the nearest resupply point. Heavy, compact items are carried as sling loads. Resupplying to remote locations is a natural mission for helicopters. The versatility of the helicopter and its ability to land almost anywhere makes it an ideal supporting vehicle for remote areas and transportation of medical supplies and teams. The helicopter is also most effective in moving construction materials to remote sites, floods, erupting volcanoes, and forest fires all require disaster relief, and the helicopter is ideal for the job. In addition to its importance in combat, medical evacuation by helicopter has been extremely successful in Central and South America. Flights have been made to many isolated jungle villages to provide medical attention and, when required, evacuation to a hospital.
the Huey performs a variety of medical evacuation and search and rescue missions. Medics, crew chiefs, and pilots are on 24-hour alert. Rescue missions include hoist pickups over land and water, day and night. Night over water pickups can be made with flares dropped from a C-47 and floating flares dropped from the helicopter. Knowledge of the techniques of formation flying is a requirement for both armed and unarmed missions. The basic element of armed helicopter organization, the fire team, can be from two helicopters to as many as needed to do the job. The fire team leader establishes the axis of advance or the direction of attack over terrain most favorable to the team as a whole. The wingman maintains a free cruise condition with the leader's axis, normally flying an extended echelon at a 45 degree angle. Normal distance between the aircraft is 300 to 400 meters. The wingman maintains a slightly lower altitude than his leader, so he can readily detect any violent changes in the attitude of the lead aircraft. He also maintains whatever position is necessary to mutually support his leader by fire and observation. Two aircraft never traverse the same ground track because observation as a team is reduced. Also, the entire team would be in line of fire from the enemy during target attack. For this reason, a wingman never flies directly behind his leader. Two aircraft traversing the same ground track would also be a mistake during reconnaissance. The hostile force would be alerted by the passage of the first aircraft and could either take cover or fire upon the second aircraft. In general, you should avoid firing until the friendly forces are positively located. This is especially true in fast moving situations or where you are required to furnish fire support with no prior knowledge of the ground plan. If flying must be parallel to tree lines, it should be conducted 50 meters inside the tree line, that is, over the trees at low altitude, to take advantage of all available cover and concealment. Remembering these guidelines, observe how a typical exfiltration mission is flown in a simulated combat environment. Gunships are normally the first helicopters to arrive at the scene of an exfiltration, whether the exfiltration is scheduled or an emergency. To begin a scheduled or planned exfiltration, the gunships are directed to the landing zone by a forward air controller. The team is located and identified by several methods. Listed in order of preference, these are radio, panels, mirror, smoke or flares. Then the gunships set up a circling pattern to check the surrounding area for enemy movement. In this way, they will be able to confirm the patrol team's information that the area is clear. When the area is determined secure, the gunships recommend the best approach route and type of pickup required which may be sit-down, rope ladders, or McGuire rake. A protective pattern is then flown around the slick 
as it makes the approach and pickup. If a patrol team is compromised, that is, discovered by the enemy or under fire, emergency exfiltration is in order. Again, a forward air controller directs the gunships to the area. Depending on the nature of the emergency, tactical air may be used to augment the firepower of the gunships. Attack patterns are flown over the area to suppress enemy fire. Air speeds and altitudes will vary on each pass. As a guideline, a minimum airspeed should be 60 knots. The basic attack patterns are the figure eight, racetrack, circling, cloverleaf, and the L pattern. A figure eight pattern is very effective for support of small ground units. Two aircraft are used. The key to the effectiveness of this pattern is timing. Passes directly over the ground team can be established so that both guns can be used simultaneously. Passes offset from the team's position allow rockets and miniguns to be used. Turns are made in random directions and should be adjusted for continuous target coverage. Racetrack patterns are used for attack against point targets employing two or more helicopters. As each helicopter breaks contact, another should be acquiring and engaging the target. A circling pattern is used for checking activity in the vicinity of an LZ. This is generally good for observation only, and a switch to a more effective pattern is required if an attack is to be initiated. Cloverleaf patterns are used when an attack is to be made from a standoff position. Attacks are made from several directions. This pattern can be used against point or small area targets. The L attack pattern is effective against point targets by presenting a concentrated volume of fire for a short period of time. It is the responsibility of the pilot to make a thorough estimate of the situation, then a final decision on the best attack patterns. When the area is secure, no more enemy fire, dry passes are made in further search for enemy activity in nearby areas. The exfiltration slick then proceeds to recover the patrol team. Combinations and variations of all the basic patterns afford the armed helicopter pilot great latitude in planning an effective attack. The gunships resume their fire when additional protection is needed. patterns and tactics are extremely flexible. They can be varied according to terrain, weather, or enemy activity in the area. Although the pilot can fire the weapon in a forward fire mode, the guns are generally fired in the side fire position by the gunners. The side firing guns offer several advantages over any other helicopter machine gun system. The 7.62 ammunition can be effective at ranges up to 1,000 meters.
However, this system lends itself ideally to much closer support. With experienced gunners, concentrated fire can be directed by troops on the ground to within 5 to 10 meters of the friendly forces. Two targets can be engaged simultaneously since the guns operate independently. With this extreme accuracy and 4,000 rounds per minute rate of fire from each gun, the minigun system is indeed a formidable weapon. Remember, however, that crew coordination is the key to success. The pilot gives the command to fire, but only after all crew members acquire the target. Functioning as a smoothly operating team, the crew guarantees the effectiveness of the weapon system. The minigun system is highly effective against lightly armed opposition. Basic gunnery tactics learned with the minigun can be applied to any machine gun system and any helicopter. The 2.75 FFAR folding fin aerial rocket is ideally suited for firing from helicopters. It gives the helicopter a standoff capability of up to 2,500 meters against a lightly armed enemy. Accurate delivery is possible between this maximum 2,500 meters